Yeah, so Storoscope is obviously real time. I mean, you're going to, if a lightning strike happens, you're going to see it instantly shown on your, uh, on your display. I remember one time we were waiting for our thunderstorms to roll through and we were sitting there taxiing and, and all of a sudden out of nowhere, we got this lightning strike. Uh, literally probably within a mile of where we were, and it showed right next to our, our airplane, essentially, uh, where we were. Uh, got our attention. So that's real-time stuff. So that we're, when you're in real-time mode in storm scopes, you have to understand how to interpret them. It's not like out-of-the-box easy to interpret, per se, so it's a good idea to get training. Let's see if the video's coming up here. All right, super. I think we are ready to roll. Three, two, one. Well, hello, and welcome to Aviation News Talk. I'm your host, Max Trescott. If you're new to our show, we have a regular weekly show in which we talk about general aviation as well as give uh, tips for pilots and offer uh, skills that they may be able to hopefully uh, you know, use someday, maybe even uh, save their life. And we are doing something different today. We are operating live from the grounds of AirVenture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And we are in the Lightspeed tent. Now, I want to thank Lightspeed very much for making room for us to put on this broadcast today. And you can see literally people are behind us. They're uh, checking out headsets and talking about the different headsets they have and so on. So again, I want to thank them for uh, offering us space in the tent. And I should just mention, I've been using Lightspeed headsets for almost 20 years, I would imagine. Uh, I've traded up different models and currently have uh, three different ones which I use, which is great. As a flight instructor, you never know when somebody comes along and says, hey... <laughs> That's right. We've got to, uh, we need uh, some help here. So if you are not listening to us live and you are listening to the regular podcast episode, just to let you know, the live stream is available again on Friday. So we'll be broadcasting again on Friday with uh, helicopter aerobatic Red Bull pilot Aaron Fitzgerald. So come, come join us for that live show. All you need to do is go out to facebook.com slash lightspeed aviation. Click on the light the like button and you will get notified of the live broadcast starting up. So we have a special guest here today, Scott Denstedt, and he's got a very interesting background. He is a weather expert, uh, and so we'll be talking uh, with him about a number of different things. So let's move on to, uh, to Scott. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a former National Weather Service meteorologist, and that, I think, is kind of an unusual combination for a pilot. I don't run into too many uh, people who have a meteorology background as pilots. Like me, he is a flight instructor. In fact, Scott and I first met uh, over a dozen years ago when we were teaching in the Columbia 400 at the uh, uh, Cessna Advanced uh, Training Sessions around the country. He is the co-founder of the new Weather Spork app, which we'll be talking about. You can probably see the logo on his shirt for, uh, for Weather Spork. And he's been teaching pilots how to minimize their exposure to adverse weather for many years. So that's really his goal in life. And part of what he's doing to help uh, promote that, he's written over 150 articles about weather, which is pretty phenomenal. He's also co-authoring a new book that goes on sale later this year called Pilot Weather from Solo to the Airlines. Scott, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Max. That's excellent. Well, so, um, oh, go ahead. Tilt this up a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Exactly. That, I think, is going to work uh, well for us. Okay. So I am just dying to know, how did you get involved in weather? Is this something, and, and I really don't know, is this something that dates back to the, your youth? Did you get intrigued by weather, or did you get caught in a hailstorm, or <laughs> what triggered your interest? It actually is interesting. My brother uh, asked me a question about what causes thunder when I was, uh, he's a uh, I was, he's 12 years older than me, and it just got me interested in what you know, the science was all about. And so from that point onward, I had a love for, for, uh, for weather. Anytime there was thunderstorms in the, uh, the area, I would always be out there on the front porch looking out, out the sky. So it really interested me. And as I got through elementary school and uh, into junior high and high school, my interest really went around also around flying. Everybody wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be a hurricane hunter. <laughs> That's great. So what, what was kind of the, the natural progression for you uh, in doing that? What, what, what was the next step? Well, the next step was to get uh, a, a degree in, uh, in, in meteorology. And I went to University of Maryland uh, and got a uh, degree that allowed me basically to work as a meteorologist. And I worked in a more research environment for about five years mm -hmm. and, uh, and eventually peeled off because I was working um, for our great government and you know, the great government that we work in. Doesn't, don't pay a whole lot, so I ended up getting into software engineering, working for several different aerospace giants, some of which in air traffic control and weather business, but uh, I got into my, um, you know, a little bit later in life, and I said, you know, I'm not getting any younger, I really want to do this pilot thing, 
And so I, uh, I, I did. I got my private pilot certificate and got my instrument rating and went on to get my CFI with the never notion of ever teaching and certainly not making it a business. Right. And then I ended up uh, uh, deciding, hey, I can actually marry up my, my meteorology background with, uh, with aviation. And I realized that the FAA requires you to learn a certain amount of weather. But in the end, you know, when you get done your check ride, you don't have to learn anything about weather from that point onward. So I thought I, I could enter into this picture and actually teach pilots about weather. So I'm just kind of curious. You said research meteorologist. Now that right. sounds very different from what we think of as a traditional meteorologist. What's what kinds of things did you work on? Well, I worked in the modeling area. So you know that most forecasts that you see are all based on computer weather models. You know, so no matter how you look at it, if it's not a forecast that's like a, a, a severe weather warning for a tornado warning or a severe a st thunderstorm warning. Uh, most of the, the forecasts you see, you see, whether it's terminal forecast or whether it's your general public forecast, meteorologists are using weather forecast models. Mm -hmm. So that was my specialty, is learning. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, the, the GFS model that you may hear about. Uh, at that time, it was the LFM, Limit at Five Mesh model, and the new model that was coming along that we were helping build was the nested grid model, and that's since been retired. And now we're dealing with um, uh, models like the rapid refresh and the high-resolution rapid refresh model. So that's, that was my specialty in the modeling area. Hmm. And I was just listening to a weather podcast recently. Uh, by, by the way, have you found, are there many weather podcasts out there? Not many. And I, I've always uh, toyed with doing something like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just there's so much to do in life and uh, I never got around to that. So I, I rely on you guys like you. <laughs> so I ran across the AccuWeather podcast, which is relatively new. I think they've probably sure. been doing it less than six months. And I'm familiar with them because I grew up in Pennsylvania. AccuWeather is uh, okay. based in State College. And, of course, uh, that's where Penn State University is, and I'm guessing they must have a pretty large meteorological program at the university. Yeah, Penn State's one of the best in the, in the country, and uh, you know, uh, University of Chicago as well, and there's a number of other good ones out there, but Penn State is probably one of the better ones. Now, on this podcast, they talked about the European model, and they talked about that perhaps being you know, better in some regards. Is that new? Has it come along since uh, the days you were at NWS? So, yeah, the ECMWF is the European Center for uh, Medium Range Forecasting. That's been around forever. I mean, it's okay. been around as long as as uh, all the other uh, models. I mean, models go through a, uh, a period of time where they get updated and, and changed. Uh, they're actually coming out next year with a new version of the GFS model. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the ECMWF and the UK MET model have been around for a long time. Hmm. Okay. So, during your time, were you associated with any large weather events that uh, were memorable? Things that. Uh, oh, yeah. So tell us about some of the things yeah. that you're involved in, the impact that that may have had on people. So, yeah, the, one of the ones was the uh, blizzard, uh, the President's Day storm in 1979. Uh, you know, I lived in the D Baltimore, D.C. area. That's where I grew up. And there was this huge uh, weather system. The interesting thing about that particular uh, storm is that uh, it wasn't really well forecast. But the, the other aspect of that, they were doing a research program where they were trying to pull in a lot more data and it was saying we're basically over the next uh, couple of weeks, we're going to pull in as much more data. We're going to put more sensors out there just to see if it helps improve the forecast. <laughs> well, unfortunately, in this particular case, it did not. So uh, so that's one of the, you know, I remember digging out of that uh, thing at <laughs> the, my, my, my parents' driveway, you know, spending hours and hours and hours trying to clear the driveway. I see. And did you talk to your parents about why the forecast might have been off? No. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so they understood that you might forecast the weather, but you didn't control the weather. That's right. I don't control it, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I did. You know, I, I think I could make a few extra bucks if I, if I do that. Indeed. So you and I have both been flying for quite a long time, and uh, you, you talked about working at NWS in 1979. Uh, the state of the art of in-cockpit weather back then was quite different than, than it is today. That's for right. us, in-cockpit weather meant just one thing, which was picking up the radio and... And calling flight service or flight watch at that time. Yeah, exactly. And so they would, uh, you know, talk to you on the radio and uh, answer your question. That was pretty limited, and I, I would say people probably didn't use it as much as they should, is, is my guess. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the kind of the modern-day uh, evolution. So uh, two major sources we find in the cockpit today. Yeah, the two major sources right now are um, your satellite-based weather from Sirius XM uh, and also the FISB weather, the uh, uh, and that all goes with the ADSB concept. And, you know, it's, you know, both uh, have a different method of, of uh, distributing that data, but a lot of the data is very similar in terms of where it comes from. Um, you know, SiriusXM has a different set of data. 
FISB has a different set of data, but for the most part, uh, I tell you, you know, I think GPS was a huge element to, um, you know, in the in the uh, world of navigation to take us, you know, so, sort of like the transistor took us from tubes to, in, into the the, elect uh, the, uh, the electronic age. Uh, you know, GPS was huge there, and I think the onboard rate, uh, onboard uh, weather that we get uh, through either through the FISB or through the satellite is one of those great inventions. It's really saved a lot of people overall and made flying a lot, let's say, easier, more manageable. Yeah, the NextRad weather project, which I think people probably had some intuitive sense of what it meant because they were really used to seeing the weather guy on TV with kind of a similar map. If it was green, yeah, it was probably mm -hmm. light rain. If it was yellow, eh, it's getting a little worse. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, uh, pilots have become really good at interpreting NextRad images. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the few things they really understand very well. You know, if you talk to them about big picture and about uh, troughs and ridges, you know, their eyes glaze over and they don't really uh, understand much about it. But when you look at a NextRad image, intuitively they start to pick up on some things. Now, there are some finer details that I try to teach pilots about in terms of things like a, a bow echo is where you see uh, situations where there's strong straight line winds at the surface. But in the end, most pilots understand that, hey, that bright red or that magenta that's coming at you is not going to be a pleasant ride if you want to go through that. And even it may be some issues down near, near the surface. So pilots have come really uh, used to being able to do that. And it's becoming a tool that uh, is, is slowly but surely becoming, you know, I don't leave unless my, I have my in-cockpit weather. Yeah. So let's talk just a little bit more about kind of the differences between uh, Sirius XM and, and uh, uh, ADSB in or okay. FISB. Why would somebody choose one versus the other, or what are the trade-offs as they're uh, choosing between them? Well, I mean, in, in most cases, uh, whatever you choose, you'll end up being happy with in the end because it will provide you with information that um, that you didn't have to, to make good decisions on. You know, Sirius XM for the most part is a is a subscription based service, so you're going to pay on a monthly basis. You can uh, up to six months put that service to rest. Uh, they'll allow you to, to put that in the background so you can then you won't have to pay for it. Whereas FISB is once you buy all the equipment, uh, essentially it's free. You get that as long as you can receive the signal, you have that availability to you. And again, in, you know, the, the, I, I think you know, in, in many cases, sometimes paying for something you know, may not be the right thing. But in Sirius XM's uh, case, uh, was what we'll, you know, potentially discuss, is that uh, it's actually not a, ba a bad product overall. That really, actually, t to me, I fly with both, but uh, I really, my go-to is the, the satellite-based weather. I totally agree. I've, I've got some favorites. Uh, so why don't you tell me about you know what you like about Sirius XM weather as opposed to FISB, and then I'll tell you. Okay, that <laughs> and sounds then, good. And they're probably the same thing, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the basic idea is that I like to see the big picture before I take off, before the wheels are up, and, and, and especially in an area where I know there's some convection nearby in my departure airport. Uh, I, I want to know the big picture. I don't want to get up and, and have to wait for the signal to be received because a ground-based system, unfortunately, you're going to see a situation where you're not going to get uh, any weather data unless you have a surface-based tower, FISB tower right there. So I like to be able to pull the airplane out of the hangar, turn the system on, and within about 15 minutes, you've got the complete picture. That's one of my favorite things about the, about the product. And, and essentially, you have coast-to-coast -coast coverage. There's no coverage gaps anywhere in there. Uh, the NEXRAD is completely 100% the same no matter where where it is in the country mm -hmm. as whereas in FISB you get a regional picture but the, um, the the national image is very blocky now you know probably 10 or 15 years ago uh, that national image would have been the greatest thing since sliced bread of but, course. but now with the uh, with FISB uh, and the reason they do that is, is basically bandwidth they can't necessarily send all that stuff up so if you're flying on the east coast do you really care what next rad looks like in Seattle you probably don't mm -hmm. but uh, in the end I really want that big picture right away before I get into anything serious. Right, exactly. So, so Sirius XM, of course, allows you to get that uh, image while you're on the ground before you launch, whereas ADS-B, right. you might not get as uh, good a picture at all until you, <laughs> you might have no data until That's right. you get above several thousand feet, depending upon your location. Of course, there are going to be a few airports in the country where you might be able to get ADS-B on the surface. Correct. But, uh, that's that's going to be relatively few of them, uh, and I guess you mentioned also that yeah, the the resolution is going to be worse when you're looking at weather that's further away on ADSB. So, is, am I right. correct that you get better resolution like for the first 250 miles or something like that? Yeah, so it, it depends. There's a look ahead factor um, that's 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 uh, fact that's factored in. If you were receiving, um, for instance, something on the ground or on one of the what they call the low tier uh, towers. Uh, you're only going to be able to see 150 miles out. But if yeah. you're receiving it on the medium or the high towers, 
in terms of the uh, the altitude, you're going to be uh, able to see out to 250 miles with the regional one. Uh, but that's as far as it goes. And of course, as you move along, it's going to hand you off to the next set of towers, and you're going to pick up more and more uh, the, the regional, more high resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the things I found that I really like about SiriusXM is the uh, storm cells uh, feature, All right. which is just fantastic. I love being able to see those little tiny arrows and put the cursor on them and see exactly what is the height of that particular cell, what direction is it moving in. Yeah, so all that comes from the NEXRAD uh, data itself. So not only does the reflectivity, the pretty colors that you see on the NEXRAD image, but the, uh, the arrows are basically storm cells or significant storm cells that are being tracked by the radar, and Sirius XM picks up on that, uh, sends the data along, and you can actually, you know, uh, uh, certain apps can plot that particular uh, direction, speed, and at that point, they also show you the height of that particular storm. So, you know, a storm that may be 25,000 foot may not be as severe as one that's 40,000 foot or 45,000 foot. So the, the real issue there is uh, you got to be careful. In the initial storm development, what you're going to see sometimes is those arrows actually can point opposite of each other. Mm. Sometimes they see development as a form of movement of cells. So you have to be careful initially. But once those uh, storms are mature, clipping along at a good rate, uh, those storm uh, cell tracks are really, really accurate. But we won't see those on ADSB. In right? you won't see those on ADSB uh, at all at this point in time. Uh, maybe in the future, but at this point, that's not uh, that's not the case. Got it. Okay. Well, so let's talk about some of the the new products that have just been uh, announced literally within the last couple of weeks. That's correct. Yeah. So they're actually right now they're doing what's called this key site deployment. They pick a area of the country and they 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 implement that just to make sure it's working and everything is good to go. Uh, and that's being done this week. Uh, next week uh, and, and the week following, they're actually going to be then deploying it to the National Airspace System. And so this is six new products. It's, um, it's three forecast products. It's essentially the turbulence forecast. It's an icing forecast. It's also a forecast for cloud tops. And then um, they're going to be providing access to center weather advisories, which blows my mind why this wasn't that way the whole time, because it's, it's an en route product, perfect for, for this kind of thing. They're going to essentially do away with the, the AirMet and replace them with the new product, which has actually been around since 2010, called Graphical AirMets or G-AirMets. And the last one I kind of like the most is Lightning Data is coming along. Ah, okay. So the products you've just talked about, are those AD only for ADS-B or are those also for SiriusXM? The products that we're talking about are only ADS-B. SiriusXM's products are not changing, mm -hmm. except they're doing two, two different things. They're actually increasing the refresh rate on the next rad on their composite next rad as well as lightning so i uh, tell people like this is that let's say that the next rad image that comes in your your cockpit and it gets refreshed let's say it's it's a hundred percent real time it, I, we know it's not it's delayed but let's say it's a hundred percent real time then you stare at that image no matter what you were using for another five minutes so it, 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 it worst case scenario even if it's real time when it gets to you which it's not it's five minutes old before it's refreshed again. So what, what's essentially what's happening here is, is Sirius XM is, is updating it twice as fast. So now instead of staring at that image for five minutes, you only stare at it for two and a half. And they actually build a new composite reflectivity image. They show you all new lightning strikes every two and a half minutes. Fantastic. Now, of course, you, you don't want to use it for tactical kind of... Um, of flying through thunderstorms and such, but uh, at least it gives you the, the indication, especially if you're headed towards an airport and you have a thunderstorm rolling in, you know, that two and a half minutes makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about a really common misconception about in-cockpit weather that is related to, to NextRad. I remember giving a presentation years ago and telling something about, uh, about uh, a group of people about the age of the data. Right. And the, uh, the, the, the smart, smarty pants CFI in the back of the room said, yeah, but it says two minutes on the screen, so it's only, yeah. two, why, you know, <laughs> it's only two minutes old. Let's right. talk about that, because I don't think people really fully understand that. Yeah, they don't. I, I, and, and the problem is we're seeing so many different variations of that in terms of the of, of a discussion. You know, you see everyone say, it's 30 minutes old or 20 minutes old. That's just as dangerous to tell people that as to say it's real-time data. So, you know, it's the obvious aspect of this is it's latent because it takes a while for that uh, that radar image to be built in the sense of you have to look at five minutes worth of data essentially and and it's using uh, in the case of a composite it's using essentially to trying to find what the worst case or the highest reflectivity in the column of air that could have come just a couple minutes ago or it could have come five minutes ago in the entire vo volume coverage pattern so you really don't technically know the age of the product per se right. um and it takes a little bit longer to downlink that and, and pr present it. So you're dealing with generally some, when it, when it uh, hits your, 
hit your screen and you see it's been recently refreshed and it may say one minute old. Well, in fact, it's probably on the order of anywhere from three to eight minutes old. And then again, you stare at that image for a period of time. Right, exactly. So it wouldn't be unusual to have it 10 to 12 minutes old by the time you're still looking at it from when it first started gathering data. Exactly. So, you know, it's uh, understandably, you could be up to the 12 to 15 minutes in, in certain cases. And if you miss an update for some reason, then that's a good uh, reason to, uh, to really sus suspect that, you know, the age on that, that product goes up from five minutes. Now it's up to 10 minutes old. You know you've probably missed some kind of update, which does happen from time to time. And so how far could the weather have moved in that time? Oh, yeah. So, so in many cases, you get a, a, you know, a thunderstorm line that's moving 40 knots, which is not an unusual situation to happen. Uh, you can be talking four or five miles, but, you know, essentially that's moved four or five miles uh, based on what you see outside the cockpit. So you know, what you see in the cockpit and what you see outside the cockpit could be significantly different unless the storms are not moving a whole lot. Uh, then it's all about intensity, you know, how... Uh, you know, how um, when you look at the cellular structure, are we dealing with just some yellows and some greens, or are we dealing with some reds and magentas in those cases? And, and uh, uh, so it, you can tell a lot about the storm uh, in, in that particular situation. So talk a little bit about the, the, the composite versus the, the base. Okay. Uh, it's, for example, you, you kind of talked about how part of what you see may have been collected four and a half minutes right. before, and yet something you saw was very recent data. Kind of explain to people why the picture you see, parts of that picture are older than other parts of the picture. Right, exactly. So the base reflectivity, uh, the term base here, I know a lot of pilots, if you ask a thousand pilots, they'll all give you the same answer. They say, what does base mean? And they'll say it's lowest. It's actually not because every elevation of the um, radar has a base reflectivity product. The, the term base comes from base data, and reflectivity is just one of the products. Velocity data, the Doppler, is another product. Spectrum width, uh, there's lots of different products. So base does not mean lowest necessarily, but in fact, most of the time when you see a NEXRAD image, either like from the government or from any, any um, that's, a, that's a single slice through the atmosphere, it's usually the lowest because, you know, think about it. That's, you know, that's where the pic yeah, picnics are and that's where, you know, sports, you know, they're really interested in that. Now, and that's the single lowest slice horizontally through the air that's, right? Yeah. That's correct. And, and ultimately, that's got to be all stitched together over a five-minute period because it takes five minutes for that, that um, radar to get back down to the next level, the lowest level. So it's, it's at least at a minimum five minutes delayed just in of itself by the time you get it. So, mm -hmm. you know, so the base reflectivity is a good product that I, I think tells you more about what's happening from a visual standpoint. So the basic idea here is that uh, what you see outside the cockpit and the base reflectivity, the lowest elevation, really gives you a good one-to-one -one mapping. The problem with composite reflectivity is sometimes you see essentially what are uh, ice crystals in, the, in the, um, the anvil. So it makes it look kind of worse than it is and bigger than it is. It'll have a larger footprint. So in those particular situations, it may, that may be better for somebody that's flying up higher. Mm -hmm. So uh, if some products will let you look both at base and some will only show one versus the other. In other words, uh, which, which of the products we've talked about will show allow you to choose between viewing base and viewing composite? Yeah, so right now the, um, the, F, the FISB product is only a composite reflectivity product. It's not a, uh, it's, it's not a base uh, reflectivity, so, uh, whereas uh, Sirius XM actually provides both to you. In fact, they provide uh, the Canadian uh, Doppler weather radar as well. And so uh, if you're using Sirius XM, you can flip back and forth between the base and the composite. That's correct. You can actually flip right back and forth between the two and compare and, and contrast. And so, for instance, you may be in a situation where you see some light green on base, maybe even a little bit of yellow mixed in, which tells you that you've got some precipitation there. But ultimately, when, when push comes to shove, you look at the composite, it's actually more red. And that's because the main core um, uh, of the, the rain core is being held up in the cloud. So let's switch and uh, talk about lightning a little bit. Okay. I think that's a topic that also probably confuses a lot of people. They probably look at it and say, hey, I see lightning on the screen. That must be all the lightning that's out there. Uh, to talk for a moment about you know, what we see uh, on one of these in-cockpit weather products versus what we might see on a storm scope. Yeah, so storm scope is obviously real time. I mean, you're gonna, if a lightning strike happens, you're going to see it instantly shown on your, uh, on your display. I remember one time we were waiting for our thunderstorms to roll through and we were sitting there taxiing and, and all of a sudden out of nowhere we got this lightning strike uh, literally probably within a mile of where we were and it showed right next to our, our airplane essentially uh, where we were. Uh, got our attention. So that's real-time stuff so that we're, when you're in real-time mode 
in storm scopes, you have to understand how to interpret them. It's not like out of the box, easy to interpret per se. So it's a good idea to get, to get training. Now, the lightning that comes either in Fisbee uh, coming up soon or in uh, the Sirius XM is based on lightning detections, detection networks that are all across the country and world, in fact. And they triangulate where those strikes are. And essentially, that's uplinked to us, and we can display it. Now, the interesting thing about the, what's coming with uh, FISBE, FISBE is only going to show you uh, cloud-to-ground lightning, as whereas the, uh, uh, the Sirius XM is actually contains all lightning, which actually is really important because in some places in the country, there's 10 times more intra-cloud lightning than there are cloud-to-ground uh, cloud strikes. So in the cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, are you more likely to see that at the beginning of the storm? Yeah, in some cases, you'll see some really nasty um, uh, developments occur, especially out in the Midwest and in, in the Central Plains, where you can be um, almost infinite number of strikes. I mean, there, there's a period of time where that ratio is infinite uh, with, uh, with some of this uh, development. Um, sometimes it's early in the development process, um, or it could be in a case of, an, uh, of a, a storm that's getting really severe. We see this case where we see it, uh, the ratio be literally, there's no cloud to ground strikes, but there's all these uh, intracloud strikes, which, uh, which again, well, if that if that were if I could if I could take one thing and make it different, I would want to know which strikes were which. But unfortunately, with the, the data links, uh, you can't the, you know, the bandwidth is limited, so you can't send all that information up. Although the FISB is actually going to send you the polarity of the strike, uh, and it's also going to uh, tell you the number of strikes hmm. in that particular uh, region. Okay, so for years, the lightning that we looked at from the Sirius XM was strictly the cloud-to-ground lightning, as I recall, with right. roughly 10% of the total right. total strikes. And those typically, really, by the time those occur, that's kind of pretty late in the game. you got a mature storm. You already know from the next rad where the storm is. Right. That's correct. Yeah. So ultimately, you know, when you're only seeing part of the picture, and, you know, uh, some folks may say, well, if I see any strikes, I'm not going there, which is, is, which is a good I idea to, you know, as a good rule of thumb. But ultimately... You know, I keep my distance. And, you know, the FA says, you know, how far they, they tell you? 20 miles, 20 right? 20 miles, exactly. 20 miles. But if I see it's a severe storm, um, you know, if I know that particular severe storm, my rule is 50 miles, mm -hmm. personally. I think it's uh, it's naive to think that you can get 20, within 20 miles of a severe storm and, and survive in some cases. Yeah, we don't see many accidents, but there are a lot of things that can happen beyond that storm that, that, are, uh, that are dangerous for pilots, especially down low. Okay, so when did this change occur in terms of we used to only see cloud to ground lightning, now we can see all lightning displayed in the cockpit? Yeah, so it's, it's a different de uh, lightning detection system in terms of what there's several. The, 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 the nice thing about NEXRAD is the government first uh, introduced that and, and built all the equipment, and, and now that's put out there for free. Unfortunately, the commercial uh, vendors out there beat the government to the lightning detection system. So there's several different vendors out there, and each vendor has its own little uniqueness to it. Some produce cloud-to-ground lightning, and others uh, will actually show you all different kinds of lightning. It depends on which network you're subscribed to. And, you know, in that case, that's the difference between FISB and Sirius XM lightning. Got it. Okay. So today with Sirius XM, you see all lightning going forward in the future with ADSB FISB. Well, you know, we'll uh, see all lightning or not. Well, no, I don't think so. I think okay. uh, what we're going to see now is uh, more um, interesting things associated with the the next rad uh, data that's coming mm -hmm. along. Uh, there, we are working on some changes to that coming up pretty soon in the um, uh, in the FISB world. I'm not going to say anything at this point, but because okay. uh, you know, things change, and if I if I say that they're, they're going to do X. I can guarantee you sometime in the near future they'll change that because all the, the, the four, four of the six products that are going to be uh, new were supposed to be actually sent, um, uh, were supposed to be uh, uh, sent out to, on the broadcast last year, and that didn't happen. Uh, they wanted to, um, I had requested that they add center weather advisories and G air mets to it, so they decided to essentially postpone that and, and do one big uh, uh, fell swoop with, uh, with, with what's happening uh, this coming week. Got it. And you're on an advisory council. Tell us about that. Right. I'm on a working group that's uh, that's through the RTCA program, and it's basically designed. It's kind of uh, you know it's kind of designed to come up with new things associated with with what they want to put on the data lake. Some of this information comes through the FA. Some essentially comes also through our own kind of feelings about what what is needed in the industry. Uh, it's made up of a lot of different people that have different backgrounds uh, from airlines. Uh, and on up, I was kind of the weather person that kind of helped them uh, take this uh, take this to the next level. I've been so busy lately uh, with uh, with weather spork and trying to get that operational. I really haven't had a chance to kind of 
enter back into that in the next phase, but I've been kind of keeping background uh, uh, understanding of kind of what's going on. Well, this is why I wanted to talk with you because I know you're on the, this working group and right. you have really great insight as to you know what things have happened in the past, what things are happening in the future. That's right. But let's talk about weather sport. Okay. Uh, so let's first talk about the uh, the name and uh, you know tell us more about the app. Sure. The the weather sport name. I mean, Spork is a uh, is a multifaceted tool, and one of the things I see there's a lot of a uh, lot of apps, a lot of companies that produce good weather data, and that weather data out there is. Um, uh, you know, it, it's really good good stuff for, for, for people, but ultimately, um, we want to also bring in the training component. So that's the concept. It's a multi, multifaceted tool that not only provides you with weather, but it also provides you the training component. So we have a lot of workshops that will teach you about a lot of these different products. And I'm also putting out videos and uh, YouTube videos. It's uh, uh, YouTube slash Weather Spork. Hmm. And you'll be able to see uh, a lot of the videos I'm building that are around how to use the, the product. Uh, in the end, so we thought the spork aspect of it was the kind of the um, the multifaceted tool. I got it. So, if you look at some of the weather product, uh, pardon me, the weather apps that that are available provide weather, they're really just serving up the weather, but they don't necessarily train you in terms of how to use those products, what you're looking for. That's correct. So ultimately, um, you may have a few videos on how to, you know, the the how tos of how to, you know tap on this and do this and what does this mean and some legends, but they really don't look at the, the big picture and that is teaching pilots about how to use this information to make good decisions. Got it. Yeah, and you, I think you commented when we first talked about how pilots may get some weather training, you know, in the, in right. the part of their license and then later uh, go on to, you know, fly for years and not really have any kind of formal form training. Uh, you know that I'm from California. Right. We have pretty darn good weather out there. I've, I've often joked that, uh, you know, when I'm teaching weather to pilots, it's malpractice. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because I'm from California. What do I know about <laughs> That's right. Um, but, but the thing I've, I've encountered over and over and over again, because I, I'm out you know, giving flight instruction five, six days a week and do a lot of uh, student pilots as well, is that I find pilots often are very good at the things that are black and white. They're really great at uh, parroting uh, regulations. You know, they can tell you about uh, required equipment in the aircraft and those kinds of things. But they've really got very kind of fuzzy notions about weather. Have you experienced that as well? And why why do you think that might be? I think, I mean, obviously, of all the disciplines you've got to learn as a pilot, weather is probably the most complex. And that's part of the issue. When you get into a situation where you are you, you know, you understand how the stick and rudder skills, you know that, you know, when you're in turbulence, you, you slow down the maneuvering speed. All of those things uh, become part of the training, and, and instructors are really good at that. The issue is, comes in that instructors themselves may not be really comfortable teaching the weather. And it's usually glossed over because in most cases, all you have to know as a private pilot, is, uh, you know, as far as uh, your, your cross countries, you basically teach the pilot enough. And, and instructors are really close to, you know, holding close to, to uh, situations where they don't want their pilots or their student pilots going out and doing anything nasty in terms of the weather. So they really back off on that. And, and, and part of it is the initial training they get is not really deep enough. Um, mm-hmm. And they're kicked out of the nest once they get their private, and they technically don't have to ever go back and learn anything about weather ever again. And it becomes the nemesis because what's going to ground you more than anything? I mean, you as the pilot may be ready to go, and, and the airplane is ready to go, but you know, Mother Nature says otherwise. And I think in training, the, um, the decision-making is pretty simple. And plus, you also have a CFI there to kind of be the right. final, final arbiter. I mean, for flight training, the, the decision really kind of boils down to, you know, does the weather that we see out the window look okay, and is it okay, you know, within 50 miles? And yet, I think uh, the training that people get as private pilots doesn't in any way uh, set them up for the 300-mile trip or things that they that they really really aspire to. Uh, tell us why things are so different if you're going to be traveling a longer distance versus if you're staying close to the traffic pattern in flight training. Yeah, unfortunately, that's true. I mean, your your uh, your flight training only requires you uh, to uh, to not go very far. I mean, you can you can uh, you know pick and choose what uh, you know essentially your instructor can pick and choose what kind of. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's very, very focused on that particular area, and you're comfortable with that weather in that area for the most part in uh, most situations. But when you're traveling literally across the country, uh, the you may be entering weather like you said you're in southern you're in California, so you're not going to be in a situation where you travel up and down from northern to southern California. You may encounter some a marine layer or two, 
and that's expected, and you kind of know how to deal with that. But if you're going over the Rockies, a whole different environment. So, uh, and the problem is you pass through maybe one or two or three fronts when you're doing that kind of thing, uh, and you're dealing with uh, potentially if you end up going from south to north, you're dealing with thunderstorms in the south, and then you got to deal with icing in the north. So it's a wide variety. I have a lot of uh, students that I've taught over the years. Um, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one training with pilots uh, uh, online, and. I can tell you for sure that uh, the, the Florida pilots get real nervous in the wintertime trying to go north because they've never experienced anything like what's up here in the, in the northeastern U.S. or anything like that, or even in the northern tier states. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's the greatest variability I find. I, I've been doing a lot of trips recently moving uh, Cirrus aircraft around the country. Oh, yeah. Somebody buys a new Cirrus, we go to the factory, bring it back across the country, uh, and oftentimes it's someone who's buying a used one, and it's going from California to Florida, right. or, you know, to Boston. They've done both those trips in the past uh, six months, and wow, you really encounter you know, very different weather. Uh, encountered uh, thunderstorms in uh, Wyoming uh, about six weeks ago that uh, just popped up really fast as we were uh, you know, sitting on the ground uh, refueling. And it showed nothing on the next ride when we landed. 30 minutes later, poof, we've got thunderstorms. And in the AccuWeather podcast I was talking about, they commented that uh, there are more uh, deaths by lightning in Wyoming oh, yeah. than any other place, which kind of stunned me. What, yeah. uh, why is Wyoming such a lightning magnet? I, I don't uh, I don't know that I agree with that, that statement, but uh, I know lightning deaths are a lot in Florida, um, but I've never heard Wyoming, although there are, I did look at uh, a list of them, and I remember seeing a couple states on there scratching my head, why is that? <laughs> um, I, I couldn't, I don't even have a clue, but I know in, in Florida, a lot of people are out on the beach and enjoying the, the weather, and, and Florida has lots and lots of thunderstorms with actually a two-to-one ratio of cloud to ground and uh, intercloud strikes, so so it's ba you're bound to get uh, in a situation where if you're outside, well, hmm. you might find yourself in uh, get, getting struck by lightning. And lightning is a big killer out there. And so I always tell folks, if you can hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Wow. Roughly how many deaths a year occur? Oh, uh, gee. Uh, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I was actually, uh, there was a... Um, it's in the hundreds, though, right? Oh, it is. Per it's, year. It's in, it's in the hundreds per year. And, yeah. um, uh, and it doesn't have to be. Then most of the time, it's stupid stuff that happens. They have you know, a bunch of kids are out and, uh, playing ball, and the referees don't bring uh, the kids back in, you know, into a safe area. Uh, you know, and, and those kind of things happen. Uh, but I was, uh, had a, 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 on Twitter, somebody was saying, here's all that. It was a shark week, I guess, or something. <laughs> and so they were talking about sharks and, and, and deaths. And it's like 10. And, but mosquitoes killed seven, 750,000 people every year. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's, sharks are not the thing we should be concerned about. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and so my recollection is on Wyoming, they said that uh, a lot of people come from out of state. They're hiking. Oh, okay. you know, they start out hiking and it's a nice day. And you know, by midday, suddenly the clouds blow up. They're out there in the open and boom. Yep. And that's true. If you're out in the open, uh, you're, you're, you are know, that's that's the worst place to be because, um, you know, lightning might not always strike the highest object. So you think, gee, if I, if I, if I go to the, the, the smaller tree, I'm okay. Mm. <laughs> it's not necessarily good. You have to be in a shelter in a car in order to avoid getting struck by lightning. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about weather spark. When people are kind of walking through it, is there kind of a, a logical progression that you uh, step them through in terms of training weather? And if so, you know, what, what are some of the different uh, steps in the process? Yeah, so weather spork was, uh, was basically created uh, uh, kind of to tackle, at least initially, the VFR and the IMC problem. We know that kills more pilots than anything else. So we're, we're tackling that. And so think about the, when you do a briefing, you call Lockheed Martin Flight Service, I guess Leos now, and, um, and uh, you call or, or you sit down with your app and you type all the information in. Basically, they say, you know, uh, give us all your, your flight plan. So you say, I'm departing out of this airport. I'm going to this airport. It's going to take me this long. I'm going to be at this altitude and departing at this particular time. And all this flood of data comes at you, all this weather data. And so you look at that and go, oh, okay, uh, that's not going to work. Let's go two or three hours later. Is that going to work? So you go through the same process, single threadedness, all weather data comes back. And you're, oh, okay, what about two or three hours earlier? And so that single threadedness is really like a trial and error process. It's very frustrating. So weather sport we've done is we've taken that, that complete process and made it into a multi-threaded situation. So you type your information in, and we're going to look at all possible departure times through for the next three days, and we're going to show you what times you can actually, let's say you're, you're a VFR pilot and want to go from point A to point B. You don't want to get stuck in a situation where you're, you're flying over some really low uh, overcast clouds. Uh, weather sport's going to allow you to see that and it's going to allow you to pick and choose the departure time that works best for you. Hmm. Okay. And so that this would be uh, something that you would actually 
use when you're ready to go plan a flight. So that's kind of the 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 pre weather. I'm sorry, the pre flight planning portion. Now Correct. you also got a training portion as well, where people that they're sitting home in their easy chair, they're not planning to to make a flight, but they just want to learn about weather. Yeah, correct. Um, you know, you uh, most of us have aviation magazines we get in the mail, and month to month, you know, they may be talking about a Husky, and the next thing they're talking about a TBM in the next month. There's no really rhyme or reason for what happens month to month, and that's what I did. Was I looked at uh, years ago, back in about 2008. I said, what are the what are the topics and subjects, and what are the weather products, and what are the the issues that pilots struggle with? Yep. And so I developed you know, what I call bite-sized workshops. These are you know, five, 10, 15 minute long workshops where it were to tackle those particular problems. So that way when they went through it, the, the light bulb would bounce in their head. Aha, I've always wondered about that. You know, things like um, you know, icing. Uh, if I climb or descend by 3,000 feet, can I get out of icing? And I, and I said, well, let me, let me investigate that and see if that's really something that's, that's true or is it just a myth? Let's and, take that as an example. Okay. Is it true or is it a myth? Yeah, it actually is very much true. So essentially, um, when, you, uh, when you're in icing conditions, typically, uh, and it depends on the clouds you're, 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 uh, you're dealing with. If you're dealing with cumuliform clouds, uh, you know, uh, those uh, cauliflower-looking clouds, pretty from a distance, if you're, a, if you're at a height where your uh, you're at, uh, at temperature is below freezing, that actually that can be continuous for you know, tens of thousands of feet in terms of uh, super cool liquid water. But if you're in a more stratus kind of cloud, uh, by changing the altitude by 3,000 feet, you may pop on top, you may go below it, hmm. you may go low enough to be below the freezing level. Um, so 3,000 feet is a good rule, but ultimately if you change, if you change altitudes by 3,000 feet, and it doesn't, it, nothing happens, that's also a possibility as well, especially in what are called stratocumulus clouds, where the, where the icing at the base of the cloud, these are these um, clouds that kind of hang near the surface, but they're you know, usually two or 3,000 feet up. They're kind of thin, they're capped by an inversion, and, and in the wintertime, they can actually have some pretty significant ice at the top. So if you're climbing through it, the base, you may have nothing. At the tops, you're getting yourself into really moderate or even worse icing in those situations. And I always tell folks, you know, if, if instructors as well, uh, in the summertime when you see those or in the spring and fall when you don't have to worry about icing, notice when you climb through that and you're doing your IFR training. Notice as you're climbing through it and watch the windscreen because mm -hmm. all of a sudden you get to the top, you'll see these beads of water starting to beat up on the, on the, on the windscreen. And then imagine turning down the temperatures to below freezing. That would be an icing scenario. Mm, okay, got it. Uh, let's see. So, um, talk about uh, skew T. That is, <laughs> and, and I know you can explain it completely to us in five minutes. Right, that's no, no, right. No, no. It's a complex topic, but it's also yeah. one that I think pilots generally don't know a lot about, and yet it's pretty valuable. But also, uh, you know, just give us kind of a brief overview of skew T, and then talk about how it may or may not be in weather spork as well. Yeah. So, uh, weather spork, we definitely use. Uh, we have a skew T uh, uh, a portion to that. We're actually building a. Uh, kind of growing our own. Uh, I'm not going to say much about that at this point, but it'll be a fantastic product once we get it, get it done. Uh, it, there'll be nothing like it out there. But ultimately, a skew T log P diagram shows the vertical profile of the, um, of the atmosphere for temperature, for dew point and wind. Uh, and it does so in a much unique way that you can start to pick out just about every adverse weather element that you can possibly think of all comes in a, in a skew T form. Now, I, I started teaching pilots years ago, um, back around 2002, as I held my very first skew T uh, uh, workshop uh, to a group of four pilots. And ever since then, it's been picked up and more and more pilots are starting to use it. Now, the thing about the, the skew T uh, diagram is it's, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it's just one, it's, it's a point forecast, so it's just one location. So it's not like a, it's telling you about the entire area, but you can start to pick out things like uh, where is the best uh, altitude where I, I, can, I, I can pick for the smoothest ride? Or am I going to find icing in these clouds? Uh, and what kind of cloud types am I going to be looking at? Cumuliform clouds, or if it's going to be a stratus or nimbo stratus kind of cloud. Uh, so the skew T diagram is not a diagram that you want to necessarily... Um, uh, learn yourself. It's not one of those things that you can just literally, um, you know, look at skew T for dummies and, and figure it out. It's a pretty <laughs> complex uh, diagram, but once you master it, once you understand it, but here's what I, I, I think uh, is great about the skew T diagram. I teach it not to necessarily teach you how to use the skew T diagram, but I teach it because in order to learn to use it, you have to understand the basic principles of weather. Hmm. So you have to understand what causes turbulence, what causes icing, what causes low level wind shear. And, and, oh, by the way, when you're done the course, 
hey, you, you know how to use this diagram. And so that's the, that's the kind of, it's a teaching tool more than anything else. Now, one thing you didn't mention about that was cloud tops. That was, so as, a, as a, a, a pilot, I've always been wondering how high are the clouds, and most of the forecasts are going to give us the bases of the clouds. They don't really tell us about the tops. Right. Does QT help us with cloud tops? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things. This is the one question I get all the time. I think if there's any w- w- weather question I get the most, it's how do I find cloud tops? And, <laughs> uh, and, and certainly uh, with stratiform cloud tops, uh, it's pretty easy. I can teach you how to, how to find the stratiform cloud tops on a, a skew T in about five minutes. That's pretty easy to do. Sure. But cumuliform cloud tops, it's going to take me several hours to teach you because cumuliform clouds, cumulus clouds, thunderstorms are all produced by rising air. So you have to understand the concept of parcel theory. Right. Now, if you talk to a glider pilot, um, even though uh, a skew T is not a required thing for any, anything for, um, uh, for a private pilot, but a glider pilot, on the other hand, uh, uh, has to know how to use the skew T. In fact, it's a required element of, of gliding, and it's it's an essential tool for them to figure out where there's lift. And they can see you can see mountain wave signatures. A lot of things can come on. And as a glider pilot, you want, mountain waves are great. Hmm. So uh, if I'm using a weather spork and I'm planning a long cross country trip, is it going to give me an idea how high I need to get to get above the clouds? Yeah. So the weather spork, we also have a profile of you, which ge- is generated. Zoom height. Which Thank is, you. Which is generated from, that's my, my, my uh, German heritage there coming out. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, that's Dunstadt. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so certainly um, the, the profile view that we have in, in, uh, in Weathersport allows you to see where clouds are. It's not going to depict essentially a convective situation. It's not designed to do that. It's basically designed right now to deal with more stratiform and nimbostratus clouds uh, where you have uh, definitely have some layers there. And it'll also show you where you've got areas of, of low IFR conditions. So you'll be able to pick that. Um, and that's kind of the best way to kind of visualize clouds along your, your route rather than trying to use the skew T to, to kind of figure it out. But in our next generation skew T product, we're going to make it easier to do that along a route of flight. Okay, good. But we could talk forever about all the different uh, facets of here. Uh, But I want to just go ahead and start to wrap things up a little bit. But let me ask you, what kinds of things would you like to kind of add that we haven't uh, talked about at this point? Uh, In in (laughs) weather-wise? Well, anything else you'd like to talk about. (laughs) I'm thinking weather-related or weather sport related uh, 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 You know, there's there's so many topics. Weather weather is one of those things that you can never run out of topics. Exactly. It's changing all the time. So when I spend uh, a a good amount of time doing some of the, you know, I'll, I'll sit down. Somebody may call me and say, Scott. I'm going on a trip someplace. Uh, can you uh, can you help me kind of understand the weather? And we'll do some one-on-one training. Sometimes that inspires me to to look at this particular weather situation and create a workshop that, that that's around that particular environment. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the things I, I I would love to be able to do more of is do more of that kind of training. Um, well, this sounds like consulting, really. I mean, are you available for people to call up and say, "Hey, I'd like to." Uh plan this trip, uh, sure. what, what do I need to pay you for sure. your time? Exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a paid pr- uh, product. Uh, okay. you know, uh, members of the weather sport get a, a, a discount. But ultimately, yeah, I do uh, one-on-one training with folks on flights. Now, on my flights, my, not your flight service specialist, you can't call me up at the last minute and say, <laughs> Scott, I'm at the airport uh, looking to try to get home. Let's get there, itis, and I will not do any training for that. But if you call me several days in advance and say, or, or email me and say, I'm, I'm making this trip, you know, can you kind of help me out uh, mm-hmm. in terms of understanding the weather and planning and stuff? So I, in, in many cases, uh, that has worked really well for a lot of pilots. It's given them the confidence to be able to go places that they normally you know, wouldn't necessarily. And it's, again, it's not... It, it's not it's not a briefing, it's training on how to do the briefing. Right, I understand. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a fabulous service. I've always thought that there should be, you know, some go-to place for pilots when they're, you know... Uh, right, right. Because I think, I think pilots in most situations, you know, they're pretty comfortable with the decisions that they have to make, but it's kind of when they're in the corner cases. Right. You know, it's kind of the, the extraordinary things. It's that, you know, that one really long trip. Hey, right. I'm going to fly to Oshkosh. I mean, there's a, there's a great example. Right. Uh, and speaking of which, I understand that there were a lot of people turned away on Sunday who yes. were trying to get to Oshkosh. I yes. spoke to a, a gentleman who had been in holding for, for three hours yep, before yep. they finally diverted. <laughs> yeah, I did a, I did a three uh, series video on YouTube about that. I basically uh, sent it out on my customer base and put it out on YouTube about the uh, weather for Oshkosh. And, uh, you know, for the most part, it turned out to be exactly right, which unfortunately was for some people was not a good thing. 
<laughs> well, at least at least they were forewarned anyway. And That's they right, could, exactly. To make their uh, decisions accordingly and uh, consider some you know al- alternates. That's right. Because certainly as, as pilots, I think uh, we always need Plan B and Plan C. Yeah, you know? Plan B and Plan C are huge, and and that's one of the other aspects of things. I when I go through this training, I'm always thinking about okay. Sometimes when, when I make flights, I sneak up on the weather. I land, wait for it to come through, and then I carry on after that. And that's a plan. That there's nothing wrong with that plan. There's no yeah. danger to it. It's actually a good strategy. And so plan B would would be that maybe I maybe my plan is to go all the way from point A to point B without necessarily stopping, but my plan my plan B or C may be stopping early uh, just to wait that weather out. Yeah, exactly. I've always thought you really want to have plan B and C before you take off. Exactly. Because once you're up in the air, especially if you're, you know, up at 10,000 feet and starting to get slightly hypoxic, your, yeah. your judgment is really going to be totally gone. You've been there, done that one. Yeah. I understand that. And, and worse yet, if you have a crying two-year-old next to you, you will absolutely <laughs> not make the right yeah, decision. I don't have that problem anymore. Well, I, I did have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the, my, my worst encounter with weather uh, certainly was uh, long before I became a CFI, but, you know, if you have a crying two-year-old next to you, it's like, not All good. you can think about is get home, even though there is that big storm there. And, hey, I'm IFR rated, so what? how big a deal could this be, <laughs> right. right? Oh, my goodness. So many different ways to get into trouble as a pilot. That's for sure. So where do people find WeatherSpork? What does it cost? Is it subscription-based? Yeah, so WeatherSpork is a companion app to my original website, avwxworkshops.com. That's A-V as in Victor wxworkshops.com and so we created this as a companion app now the app is free to download but in order to use it and get the weather data you have to become a subscriber of avwxworkshops.com so it's if you go to weathersport.com there's a join now button it's $79 a year um, for that particular service uh, you know, it comes out to like, I don't know, 22 cents per day or something like that. So it's really, uh, and we're not necessarily competing with all the uh, electronic flight bags out there. That's not our goal. Our goal is to be a supplemental product to them. We mm-hmm. want to basically be the, 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 the organization that does weather the best. And that's the kind of thing. So, you know, you might have four flight or you might have uh, Wing X or you might have both of them. But we're trying to look at... Um, having our customer be everybody who, who has an EFB subscription out there uh, and use this particular product to help uh, save some time, find that, that perfect time to depart, and then they can go use the, uh, the power tools with, with ForeFlight and others to basically pull together and, uh, and make all the details and find that, that you know, it's going to take uh, you know, uh, two hours and 27 minutes and, 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 and 18 point some gallons of fuel to, to mm-hmm. get there. Those guys do that better than we're, and we're not going to do that. Right, I understand. So you're a perfect complement. So essentially, exactly. for someone who wants kind of um, simple weather that they need to interpret, go to one of the other flight bags. But if you really want to know everything there is to know about the weather in a, right. kind of an expert fashion, you've, you've got that tool available. That's correct, yep. All right, super. Well, again, I like the logo. Got the uh, WeatherSpork uh, logo right. on there. And, of course, Spork is S-P-O-R-K. Right, exactly. So you're looking for weatherspork.com. Correct. And also avwxweather.com. Dot com. Dot avwxworkshops.com. Oh, I'm sorry. So avwxworkshops.com. Correct. Got it. That's super. Well, Scott, this has been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for joining Thanks us today live in the tent okay. on Aviation News Talk. Appreciate it. Well, that's great. And uh, I, I'm sure there will be lots of opportunities for us to follow right. up. Make sure you keep us informed as uh, uh, new products come out and we'll new, new features and so on. So. We'll do it. Thanks, Max. Great. And uh, should I uh, be wearing a hat here at Oshkosh, to, do you think? Uh, you know, I think it's probably a good idea. <laughs> okay. I think there's going to be some rain coming tonight. And I see some sky typing going on up yeah, there right. right now. So we see the, the letters E-A-A have just been uh, strange, written in the... In the strange the, clouds. <laughs> 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 those clouds. So are, are those cumuliform? Those are kind of... Lin- they're probably yeah. more stratus. Yeah, there you go. Very that's high it. stratus. That's very high stratus, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, I want to thank everybody who's been listening to us live here from the grounds of AirVenture Oshkosh. Uh, we're in the Lightspeed tent. We want to thank Lightspeed again for uh, providing this uh, space for us. And we're going to be back here again on Friday. We'll be talking with Aaron Fitzgerald. Aaron has just joined Red Bull's aerobatics team, and we'll be talking about what it's like to fly aerobatics in a, get this, helicopter. Yeah, exactly. Good stuff. <laughs> that's gonna Good be, stuff. That's going to be exciting. Thanks again for joining us on Facebook Live or for joining us in the Aviation News Talk podcast. I'm Max Truscott. We'll talk to you soon. Well, I'm back from a week at Air Venture. This is the third of uh, five different interviews we'll be rolling out. And before I wrap up here, I just want to mention a couple quick things. First is our question of the month. I'm going to extend this out to August 11th. So please, if you would, 
pass along some answers to me uh, to this question. What did you learn after you got your private pilot certificate that you kind of wish you'd learned before you got your private, either as a student pilot or something that you feel should have been included in pilot training? Uh, so go ahead and either send me an email or you can record your answer and there will be links in the show notes. So on your smartphone, you can just tap for the notes and find those links to either email me or send a recording. Let's get those in by August the 11th, 2018. Tell me what you got after you got your private that you wish you had learned as a student pilot. And if you think that someday you might buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me today so I can help arrange a free demo flight for you if you're thinking about a new Cirrus, but also to help you understand the many factors, many of which are not obvious in buying a new versus a slightly used Cirrus. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. Also, if you would just take a moment to think of one or two of your friends who you think might enjoy this show, if only they knew about it. Then later today, contact them and tell them about how to find the show. This is the way that most people find the podcast because someone like you took a moment to tell them about the show. And if they're not familiar with what a podcast is, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store where they can download our dedicated aviation news talk app. And until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs> <laughs>